Hello friends, my name is Mandy Nance and today I'm going to wrap up the next batch of books that I read. I made it a goal of mine and I told a few people in the comments that I really wanted to start posting more regularly over the summer now that my very busy travel season has passed and I have no plans to go anywhere other than Book Net Fest when it comes in the fall. Today I was all ready to start recording after work and I realized that my camera wasn't charging, like it broke. And the amazing thing is that this is my second camera. I had a Canon that when I moved to this apartment, I put it in with a bunch of stuff in a box and I don't know what happened, but I think the sensor is damaged. It was gonna cost me so much money to get my Canon fixed that I just bought a point and shoot kind of vlog vlogging camera because that was more in my budget. Now that isn't charging, so I am recording this on my iPhone, which is why I'm sitting down. This is a little bit different from how I usually record. It's not ideal. It's a total first world problem. Like, it's fine. I'm a little bit frustrated because I don't have money to fix these things and I don't know why they keep breaking, whether it's me, whether I'm not really good with my stuff or it's bad luck or I don't know. I just, I don't like it. I'm gonna try and make this work as best I can. Hopefully this looks okay. Looks a little crooked to me, but the real reason we're here is for some mini reviews of the next batch of books that I read, so let's get to it. Book number 10 was A Great and Terrible Beauty by Libba Bray. People I love really love Libba Bray and enjoy her books. I saw her at Y'all Fest one year on a panel or two and I thought that she was phenomenal. It just seemed kind of inevitable to me that I would eventually read Libba Bray, but the most talked about of her series I would say is the Diviner series and it just is too scary for me. I have asked people multiple times, like, are can I read this? Like, I keep trying to, like, approach it from different angles and really kind of figure out how scary it is. But apparently, every answer that I get, there is no answer that I've gotten that makes me think that I could read this and not lose my ish. I'm too chicken. I'm too chicken for that series. I don't like, like, reading about the occult or things like that. It just freaks me out. I'm not gonna do it. So me and the Diviners is probably never gonna happen. And so I decided to go back in time and pick up the first book in her YA historical fiction slash fantasy series, A Great and Terrible Beauty. I will go for the cheap joke here and say that it was mostly terrible. In this story, 16 year old Gemma Doyle is shipped off to a boarding school or a finishing school of sorts after her father commits suicide. She also has visions of the future. So while she's at the school, she has kind of the dual story of dealing with the popular mean girls at the school and also figuring out what these visions are and what her powers are. Because of the setting, I think that Bray was trying for some commentary here about the constraints of the time and the lack of agency, but it ended up making her rebellious characters act in a way that I thought lacked a lot of logic or a sense of self-preservation. It became frustrating for me to read because I couldn't follow their logic, their thought process. I didn't understand why these characters were taking the actions that they were. Furthermore, the friendship at the core of this story, the friendship between the mean girls essentially, never truly felt like a friendship to me. It was something that was based on a lot of girl hate and I just am not a fan of those kinds of stories. The plot itself just kind of meanders between the school, the friendship, and the magic, and a lot is said but very little happens at the end of the day. It felt to me like that the same problems of the characters, the fact that they didn't have very much substance, was reflected in the plot as well. I just felt that it, there wasn't a lot there. There was a rush and patched together romance that I didn't get at all. It's made worse by the fact that the love interest is a man of color and he gets othered and fetishized because of his exotic looks. There is a community of Romani people in this book and they are repeatedly referred to with the G word. The men are very aggressive towards the girls from the boarding school in a sexual way and the women of this community are very mystical minority esque. So all of the characterizations of the people of the color in this book were, were stereotypes, they were not well done, and you could argue that it was a product of the time that this book is set in, but that's never, none of that thinking is ever countered on the page, and I, I just don't want to read about it. In addition to all of that, there's another character who is repeatedly fat shamed, and then there's some self-harm that is thrown in here as well, and none of that is just ever addressed, and none of that is called out, and so it was a lot of different things that just 
weren't pleasant to read about on top of these characterizations and that I didn't enjoy. I didn't like the friendship and I didn't like the main character. I didn't like her decisions or following her decisions and the plot itself was just kind of meh. It is dangerous to look back at some of the popular YA of the early 2000s and here it just wasn't worth the time. I rated this one out of five stars. Book number 11 was A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengel. This is a classic children's science fiction fantasy about a young girl who leaves her home on an interdimensional adventure to find her missing father. I read this for my podcast, The Snark Squad Pod, in anticipation of the adaptation that came out this year. So we read the book and dedicated an episode to that. And then we went and watched the movie and dedicated an episode to that. On the book episode, we have Chelsea from The Reading Outlaw join us, who she's also a booktuber and she has a podcast of her own. I'll leave all of those links in the description if you want to check out the episode because we have a lot of feelings. I think a lot of those feelings come from coming to this book as an adult in 2018. It felt a little bit heavy-handed to the adult eye and being outside of that time period because it was very influenced by what was happening at the time and communism and, and things of that nature. So removed from that, it did feel a little bit heavy-handed, but I think it shines through with the protagonist. I loved Meg. I love that she was this girl at the head of her story who was good at math and very emotional and she got some very relatable flaws which were then interpreted as less than flaws they helped her story overall. There is a briefly seen but very heavily felt family dynamic that anchors the story. You get a lot of Meg and her little brother Charles Wallace and that was adorable and beautiful but also the love between the parents and just the driving factor of Meg going to find her father because she misses and loves him. All of that is just stuff that I love and that really touched me in the story. It made the fact that the end game of the story and the major theme is that like love conquers all and I was totally into it because it was family love and brother sister love and I just, again love it. When I finished reading this I rated it three stars but looking back I think it has settled in my feelings a little bit more and I'd be more comfortable giving it a three and a half to four star out of five stars. Book number 12 is Soulless by Gail Carriger which is a reread for me. I wish I could remember what inspired me to reread this but I pretty much need very little excuse to reread like ever. This is an adult paranormal steampunk story about a girl who is soulless which means that when she touches creatures it kind of zaps them of their power so if she's touching a werewolf they're no longer a werewolf etc. At the beginning of the story she is attacked by a vampire and accidentally kills it and that kind of involves her in this ongoing mystery for the rest of the book. I had so much fun reading this book the first time around and I had a lot of fun rereading it this time around. Alexia Terabati is a fantastic main character. She's smart and sassy and capable, assertive, and she is the heart of the story and of what makes it so entertaining to me. The supporting characters are all really bright and colorful and very memorable, just as memorable as Alexia is. I think to really appreciate the humor in this book, you have to look at the ways that Carragher is both paying homage to the genre and poking fun at it. It's very self-aware and something that could become cliche in another book is tongue-in-cheek in this book because of the way that she is employing these cliches. A great example of this is a scene where Alexia and her main love interest are in grave danger but she can't take her hands off of him or else he'll turn back into a werewolf and they end up kissing because they can't stop touching each other so it takes this idea of like kissing at the very inopportune moments that we've all read in books because you know monsters and why are you guys doing this right now but it gives it a purpose and a reason and it makes fun of it because they cannot literally keep their hands off of each other because it means that something bad will happen. It's just a book that I really enjoy. It's a romp, it's well written, and it has one of my favorite main female characters to boot. Book number 13 was a graphic novel, The Storekeeper, which is volume one in the Amulet series by Kazu Kibuishi. I thought that this was beautiful to look at and interesting but very full of setup, which volume ones of graphic novel series tend to be. Honestly, that's what I wrote down in my quick Goodreads notes, but so far removed from the reading experience, I, I really can't remember what was in this volume of the graphic novel. And if I were ever to continue, which I will because I was gifted the first three volumes of this graphic novel series, I would have to reread the first one. I think that is partly because it was very setup heavy, but mostly it was because that was the beginning of the time that I got sick with the flu. Like in and out of fever dreams, thought I might die alone on the couch kind of flu. 
I'm not trying to be dramatic. It was awful. During that time, I ended up reading five books, which I'm not going to mention here. I'm pulling them out of the sequential order of how I read my books, and I want to make a separate video about them because there was something in common about those five books that I read, and I kind of want to talk about what I remember about them. <laughs> I swear I read them from start to finish, but, you know, hazy fever dreams and all that, and just a little bit more about the kind of books that I read and some feelings that I have about them. So understanding that we're breaking a little bit from chronological order here because I'm taking those five books out, I'm counting book number 14 as Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Dude, I just said I was sick. So any of you who know me at all who have been watching my channel know that not only do I reread Pride and Prejudice every year, at least once a year, but it is like my chicken soup when I'm not feeling well, when I'm stressed, or when I'm packing, I'm either rereading Pride and Prejudice or watching one of the adaptations. I just love it. It is a very comforting thing for me at this point. And so while I was sick with the flu and on the couch thinking I might die, I played Pride and Prejudice on audiobook. I can cross it off my yearly reread list because that is done. There's not a lot for me to say here because I've talked about this book a lot on my channel and also because it's such a part of my experience as a reader that it's very difficult for me to talk about it critically and I certainly was not reading it at that time to talk about it critically. I was just consuming something comfortable and that's all there is to say about that. This is a five out of five star read for me. Finally, book number 15 was A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. I did it! <laughs> this was probably the third time that I tried to read this book and I kept getting sidetracked by the fact that I watched the TV series first and the very beginning of book one is so similar to season one. It tracks pretty well throughout the entire book but the beginning especially is like lifted some lines of dialogue so I kept getting to that part and just kind of feeling like oh I already done this so I did not have much success trying to read this in the past. I picked this up again for Snark Squad. This year when we launched the podcast, we also opened a Discord. And so one of the first things we did when we all joined the Discord and we were building our community there was decide that we would buddy read some things. And somebody suggested the A Song of Ice and Fire series because we do recap it on the blog and so there's such a long wait until the next season. So we decided to buddy read it. And then that became dedicating a podcast episode to each book in the series. It's me, Nicole, and Democracy Diva, Sam, who she's one of our Snark ladies so she blogs Game of Thrones with us. She was a book reader first and she also has a really great blog if you love fashion and snark. I will link that in the description as well. I know that I talk a lot about the Snark Squad because it is also a project of my heart but if you enjoy Game of Thrones the TV show those recaps on our site are some of my favorite dating back to like season one. So if you ever want to revisit any of the seasons or kind of check out what it is that we do on the Snark Squad I would suggest those recaps in particular because I just I love them. I know I I helped to write them, but <laughs> I also love them. <laughs> I had a lot of feelings about reading A Game of Thrones because it was kind of a struggle bus reading experience, but also full of characters that I love, but also it's very grim and dark and full of violence and definitely not for everyone. And also it was like revisiting the traumatic beginnings of all of these characters that I love. So I was full of emotion and we talk a lot in that podcast episode about what an enjoyable reading experience is and how you can enjoy reading a thing like a Game of Thrones even though it's not enjoyable to read because it is so dark and grim and heavy. I have to say though that it's a world that I just think is so impressive in scale and it's a story that is so detailed and even knowing things vaguely that happen in the future because of the TV series even though I know it kind of strays from what the book does you see all of these threads that Martin is laying out and it is very, very impressive. I loved the way that this starts off as just feeling very political and then you get these streams of magic starting to get injected into it and the way that it shifts from being kind of who's on the throne and all of these political machinations and then you start saying, okay, wait, no, but like ice zombies and like other magical things happening over here. So the world really starts to bloom into magic and I love the way that those two things play off of each other. Balancing all of those feelings with the fact that it is very detailed and very dense and sometimes I didn't want to read it because it was so dark and it was breaking my heart. It was just a very complicated reading experience for me and I ended up giving this four out of five stars. That's it for me today. If you have read or want to read any of the books that I've mentioned, let's chat down in the comments.
comments. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you guys soon. My next wrap up video will be about the fever reads. So that's cool. <laughs>